The following episode of The Kingdom of Isolation contains footage from the film being discussed. The footage is used solely for the purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support the animators by watching this film on Disney Plus or home media where available. This episode also contains spoilers throughout. Hello Disney fans and welcome to the latest episode of the Kingdom of Isolation where in times of trouble why not celebrate the magic of Disney and today we're looking at the last hand-drawn film for the foreseeable future Home on the Range released in 2004 now based on the reception and box office intake this film isn't that great but of course I'm contractually obligated to watch these films and it's not great watched it once and Never watching it again, and you'll understand why. Nevertheless, let's begin. So, the Walt Disney logo gets branded on something. What that something is, we don't know. I guess it's just to imply we're in the Old West. Oh! And yeah, but they don't waste time getting there to the country music, and hang on a bit. What? Hang on. What on earth am I watching here? A rabbit being chased around because... Why? Oh, oh dear. The title track, I'm not a fan of, to be honest. Which is... It's it's a shame. Especially, especially given the fact that it's Alan Menken back for the first time since Hercules to help with the music. And he has Glenn Slater helping him with the lyrics this time around. Now, Glenn would go on to help Alan in numerous projects in the future, including a Broadway adaptation of The Little Mermaid in 2008. Rest in peace, Howard Ashman. A musical version of Leap of Faith. Sadly, not Miles Morales, unfortunately. Would be pretty cool to have a Spider-Verse musical, though. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> yeah. Would be pretty cool to have a Spider-Verse musical with that scene, though. How would they do that, though? Probably with wires. Anyway. Glenn also collaborated with... Wait. What? Wait, wait. Andrew Lloyd Webber? Oh, how's about that? This was for Love Never Dies, which is a sequel to... <clears throat> You are the phantom of the opera is there inside your mind. And a Broadway adaptation of School of Rock, as well as returning to work with Alan on Tangled and the songs for Gallivant on ABC. But back to Home of the Range Hill. And we see a wanted poster for Alameda Slim. Who's anything but? Who's anything but Slim? I think that's the joke. Anyway, $750. A pretty tasty reward, which would equate to about $25,000 in 2023 money. Why such a high reward, though? Wait, what happened? What happened? He stole 500 cows in one night? How? Guess we'll have to find out later. Home on the range. Oh, good lord. Oh, good lord, this accent feels forced. Oh, this accent feels forced. That's me. I'm a cow. Also, thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, that's Maggie, who's... The main character. I have to suffer through this forced Western accent. Through the entire... Which I can only assume to be some form of Texas accent I've never heard before. 
I have to suffer through this for the entire film? <sighs> okay, it's must. It's must. Maggie is voiced by Roseanne Barr, best known for her for her eponymous show, Roseanne, which also starred John Goodman, last seen in The Kingdom of Isolation. And I'm trying to work this out based on when the episodes were recorded and uploaded. Last scene in the Kingdom of Isolation, helping Cusco find his new groove. <laughs> I had to, I had to, I had to put that in there to give my own uh, spin on the James A. Jimmy scene. Last scene on the kill count, yada yada yada. Mm. Anyway, Maggie's supervising animator was Chris Buck, who was previously a supervising animator for Pocahontas with Percy Willow and Wiggins. Directed Tarzan before helping direct Sir, both So Up films, Frozen's one and two, and will also be directing Wish as well as helping with the story later this year. No joke, I cannot get through that first trailer. And yeah, the first trailer being the teaser trailer, but look, let's face it, it, it's the first trailer. The teaser trailer is something like what we saw with the live action remake of Beauty and the Beast. That's a teaser trailer. That first trailer for Wish is trailer one. The supposed first trailer for Wish is trailer two, in my eyes. Anyway. I cannot get through that first trailer without tearing up because I think this film could live up to the hype built around a story a century in the making. Still hard to believe Disney is 100 years old this year. Yes, I'm intentionally trying to get as much behind-the-scenes stuff in as possible, so I don't have to talk about this film. Because there's hardly any behind-the-scenes trivia on IMDb. Still, need must. Yeah, they're real. Quit staring. This got a PG rating. For that! I've seen films get a PG rate 13 rating for less! What size? What size doesn't matter. Stay out of this, Anna! I'll get to you soon enough! Maggie tells us how Alameda Slim, voiced by Randy Quaid, with Dale Bear being the supervising animator, managed to steal 500 cows in one night! I'm sorry, but with how loud the yodeling was in that moment, surely someone would have heard him! But no, plot says no one heard a thing except the only cow left. Slim, if you're going to steal the entire ranch, make sure you have all the cows! And leave nothing behind! Abner sells Maggie to a dairy farm, which see, which, which she seems pretty ecstatic about heading to. And this farm, this dairy farm is called Patch of Heaven. And cue the track of the same name. Sung by K.D. Lang. And we get introduced to the rest of the cast for the rest of the film. Please don't have forced access, please don't have forced access, please don't have forced access, please don't have forced accents. I'll say this, Little Patch of Heaven, which I can't listen to on Spotify, annoyingly. I doubt I'd want to listen to it that much anyway. Is okay. It's nothing special, it's just a classic introduce the setting, introduce the setting and characters song that doesn't do anything special. Sometimes it's okay to do a song like that. But with a budget of $110 million, you'd think some of that went towards making, and I'd hate to, and I hate to say it, a more memorable soundtrack. I know, shocking that I have a soundtrack I don't like. How many times have I said I don't like the soundtrack on this show? How many times have I said that in general? I love my film soundtracks, and to be treat and to be greeted with this. Also, some of that budget, some of that budget could have made the animation stand out a little bit more. At least. Anyway, one of the chicks that somehow makes a cockerel sound causes the actual rooster to fall off the chimney. I'll admit that did get a small chuckle out. Small emphasis on small. Probably one of the small handful of positives I'll have for this film today. The two cows on Patch of Heaven, probably two cows on the two cows on Patch of Heaven, 
probably some silly sitcom that might have been me. <laughs> probably some silly sitcom that might have been made around this time. Patch of heaven. <laughs> uh, I'm Mrs. Calloway, voiced by Judy Dench. Now, Judy Dench. Judy, Judy Dench. Na 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 na. Judy, Judy Dench, Judy Dench, Judy, Judy Dench. Where do we begin with her resume? My word. She started in the National Theatre back in 1957. Her rise to prominence throughout the 70s and 80s, and then an established rate. Well, let's see what we can do. And, well, I'll get into, I'll, I'll actually, I'll try and keep this as short as I can. Um, she's been nominated for a number of um, Oscars uh, for Best Actress in Leading Role and Supporting Role. Uh, Mrs. Brown, Chocola, Iris, Mrs. Henderson Presents. Mrs. Henderson Presents? I've heard about that one before. I have definitely heard about this one before. I'm trying to think where... It tells the story of Laura Henderson, a British sociolite who opened the Windmill Theatre in 1931. Oh. Well, might give that a watch at some point. Is it on any streaming platforms? Come on, I think of it. Right. It says it's on Amazon Prime. Ah. Red box. Okay. Big bust. Uh, notes on a scandal. Philomena and... Ooh! Oh, she was in Belfast as well. How about that? Uh, and actually, I should say Dane Judy Dench. Dane Judy Dench. I apologize for not giving her the correct title. But nevertheless. But, uh, nevertheless. <sighs> Relief. Accents that are not forced. And they actually get to use their actual accents. Thank you. Why couldn't Roseanne Barr do that as well? But no, they had to give her a forced Western accent. Oh, boy. And one of her other prolific... Well, she got nominated... One, two, three, four, five. Five Best Actress nominations. Uh, three Best Supporting Actress nominations. One of them was a win for Shakespeare in Love. Criminal it beats Saving Private Ryan Academy. And she's won a number of BAFTAs. And she even got nominated for one when she was in Skyfall. Uh, one of her most, uh, one of the best known roles that I know her for, anyway, is when she was M in uh, the James Bond franchise from her, from the Pierce Brosnan debut of Goldeneye in 1995 all the way to her last outing as M in Skyfall in 2012 for Bond's 50th anniversary. And we also have... Uh, where the flip am I in my notes? Where am I in my notes? Yes, here we go. Yeah, this is where we are. Um, so, did you think... And Grace, voiced by Jennifer Kelly. Get out of here, Chucky! Who they said? Jennifer Tilly. And interesting little factoid regarding her. She was in... She, she's a bracelet winner in the ladies' event for the World Series of Poker. The first celebrity to win a World Series tournament. She won the third World Poker Tour Ladies Invitational Tournament, nominated for Poker Listings Spirit of Poker Living Legend Award in 2014. And as of 2019, her live tournament winnings exceeded... One million dollars. Thank you, Dr. Evil. Uh, so, yeah, uh, from that Chucky clip, uh, she was the voice of Tiffany in the Chucky films. Uh, she was also in Stuart Little. Uh, she was in Liar Live in 1997 alongside uh, Jim Carrey. Uh, she was in a film called 
Runa, was that the... No, thankfully not. Not the one that Sasha Baron Cohen is... Uh, oh! She's been in the Kingdom of Isolation previously as well, uh, in uh, Monsters, Inc., as the voice of Celia, Mike's uh, girlfriend. Uh, she was in the director video sequel, Bartok Magnificent. Uh, and yes, it's a director video sequel to Anastasia. I might get round to those later on. Uh, oh, the, of pump. the poker movie as herself. Interesting. Um, the Cult of Chucky. And one of her best known roles on television. And oh my, she's got a lot of television credits to her name. So let's have a look. Uh, some of her best known roles. Uh, she she's uh, currently Bonnie Swanson in uh, Family Guy. Uh, she was in an episode of Hey Arnold. Uh, she was in Frasier at one point. CSI, the Cleveland Show for the pilot episode. Interesting thing. Uh, she was a guest judge on RuPaul's Drag Race. Even she's been on The Simpsons at one point. I mean, everybody's been on The Simpsons at some point. Uh, she also reprised her role of Celia in Monsters at Work. I really hope they get a second season out of this. Talking of which, do they have? A second season on the way Hollywood strikes aside. Is there going to be a second season? Um, second season. Uh, ah. Aha! Aha! There it is! A second season was announced and is set for release in 2023. Did they get it all recorded before the strikes started? Did they get it all recorded and edited before... The strikes began. Oh my word, I really hope they did because I cannot wait to see this second season. The first season is really, really good. And I might actually I might actually do I might actually do a Kingdom of Isolation episode. Well, I might actually do a mini run of Kingdom of Isolation episodes talking about each episode. If you guys want me to do that, let me know in the comments. And I might try and get Mr. Mikael on board. Uh, so anyway, um, so, uh, the three piglets, the three piglets next, and they're bothering the grumpiest goat ever, Jeb, voiced by Joe Flattery, calling him a well, can hog. Um, a so, kids, kids, ever heard of respecting your elders? Calling him a can hog is not exactly very nice, and for that matter, ne neither is Jeb keeping all the cans for himself and still wanting more. Greedy can hog. <laughs> yeah, me. Well, hey, hey, look. Hey, look at me. I just turned into a hypocrite. You're welcome. Oh, I did not look forward to I was not looking forward to this one, and I am dreading doing this for Chicken Little next. Oh, boy. Next, we have the owner of Patch of Heaven, voiced by Carol Cook, <clears throat> introducing Maggie. And... Hey, Maggie, it's my job to do those sort of entrances. She used to be a show cow? Huh. Makes sense. But still, don't steal my thunder. Oh, great. More innuendos. I get the feeling this is just aimed at kids. Jeb gets a can put over his mouth, which, <laughs> yeah, it got another chuckle out of it. This is not going to end well, is it? Nope, Maggie's about to sell him one of the piglets! Well, well, they decided to belch after eating some of the crops. Don't worry, these ones were already harvested. Tin can tag next when Buck decided to join Maggie in stealing my entrances! <sighs> Buck is voiced by... Cuba Gooding Jr., who won an Oscar for Jerry Maguire? Well, talk about a huge downgrade. At least Michael Sorry was on board as supervising animator. Thank goodness someone has some experience in anima with animated characters. And yes, this is a direct jab at Cuba Gooding Jr., because good lord, the way he voices this guy is so insufferable! Sam, unfortunately, delivers a bank notice to Pearl, stating either pay the debts within three days or Patch of Heaven is gone. Uh, should have known with a name like Patch of Heaven, this was not going to end. Well, it was going to go south very quickly. 
How convenient, though, that the bank notice is for the exact same amount as the wanted poster earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's not foreshadowing in any way, he says sarcastically. Pearl wasn't Pearl wasn't kidding when she said they when she said they were family looking out for each other. Something else in the small list of positives about the film. So they try to win the money at a county fair. Bet the money they find Slim there while they're, while they're there and do nothing to catch him until the end of the film. We'll just keep that to the side because it becomes important later. They do nothing to catch him until later in the film at the end. We'll just keep that to the side. So our cow trio head to town and hold up. What's with the aspect ratio change? Oh, it's Buck trying to emulate a Western showdown, which turns out to be just a dream. Wow, never seen that before. Telegram reaches the sheriff and we find out Rico is coming to town. Who's Rico? Don't know. Don't care. Can the next 65 minutes be over with already? So... The cows misread a star on the door so the sh for the sheriff's office, and it turns out to be a saloon stage, and somehow everyone's enjoying the action. What kind of sheriff's office is that? Dancing girls, gambling. Oh, how does he ever get any work done? That's because it wasn't the sheriff's office, you fool! <laughs> well, if it isn't three maids a milking. Buck, it's eight maids a milking. And apart from that, this one came out. April 2004, four days before my birthday. And I am so glad I decided not to go and see this. Also, fuck, you're eight months early for the 12 days of Christmas! <sighs> so Rico decides to make a dramatic entrance. Something that should only be done by me! Anyway, Rico is voiced by Charles Dennis and Russ Edmonds, uh, with Russ Edmonds as a supervising animator. Buck starts fanboying hard when he's chosen to be the horse. Rico needs to catch Slim. Something Maggie decides could work save could work to save the farm. Oh great, too much convenience and not enough laughenience. Maggie and Calloway get into a scuffle thanks to the hat of all things, and can you stop forcing these jokes? This town is clean. And they get a racial stereotyping now. I don't think Asians would have been in the Old West in 1889. They were? Let the saliva flow! <sighs> oh, please, John Cleese, not now. I need something to wipe this film from my memory. Grace, can you not sing anymore, please? The last of the last of Dixon Ranch is sold to totally not Alameda Slim in disguise. Yancy Odell. Why Odell? Yodel. Could you make it any more obvious? The cows reach a cattle drive and great. Or blatantly obvious ways of saying the cattle went to bad guys show up and give us one of the worst villain songs ever. Now I can see now I can see why art director Michael Michael Guillermo got fired because of this train wreck. Screenwriters Will Finn and John Sanford originally pitched this idea as an animated feature film based on the myth of the Pied Piper. Maggie the Cow was originally written as a deaf girl, My but hey, Michael Eisner immediately hated the idea because he thought no parent would take their children to see a movie where children are mur murdered. So, so Sanford... So Finn and Sanford wrote this movie which contains elements of the Pied Piper myth. So let me get this straight. Disney don't want a film where kids are murdered, but are perfectly fine with films where 
That include the Horned King being obliterated by the Black Cauldron, tackling religion in the Hunchback, having Clayton's corpse hanging in shadow from the trees in Tarzan, and even killing Bambi's mum, and Scar murdering Mufasa right in front of our faces, showing us the corpse of Simba's father afterwards in The Lion King. But a film based on the Pied Piper? Oh no, that's where they draw the line. Swelling Bullets, though was the original working title for the film, where an early plot idea was about a calf named Bullets who saved his herd from a band of ghost cattle rustlers called the Willies. I'll say this. I'd have rather watched that than what we got. So Slim manages to get away with 5,000 cattle as Rico and the rest are about to catch him, and then this, and then this happens. Yeah, great. He got away. What part of cover me didn't we understand? Look, I'm sorry. Cover you? Cover you? You got hypnotized by yodeling! Which I'm putting down to... Which I'm putting down as a more kid-friendly version of being high on drugs. Yeah, I said what I said. Also, thank God Rico isn't writing buck anymore. That didn't sound like singing to me. And, you know, I have perfect pit. Grace, just go and get on with it. This is the sort of film I expect from the director of video films. Not an animated classic. Yeah, this is a fine kettle of fish. Oh, a fine kettle of fish, eh? Well, this film is one stinking kettle of insufferable pain! Calm down. Not now, 17, or I'm gonna come and high your ass into the middle of next week. Oh my word. Even his henchmen, henchmen, if you can call them that, are insufferably dumb. We get even more convenience where patch of heaven on the map is the exact shape of that idiot's head so we go back to patch of heaven looking anything but where jeb is being just as horrible as ever to everyone buck decided to be an even bigger detestable character than jeb and screw the cows over just as the rain was going to do that anyway, turning into a flash flood. Finally, some danger. They've had it way too easy up to, up to now. Tension between characters, how original, before they make amends. The next song, Will the Sun Ever Shine Again, helps give us even more misery, as if I haven't had enough as it is. I can't even listen to this on Spotify. I can't even listen to this on Spotify. Probably for the best. Grace then finds a wise man who turns out to be a rabbit. Wait a minute. That's the same rabbit from the intro to the film. Who just so conveniently knows where Slim is hiding. Echo mine, to be exact. Slim tries to go through the plan one more time, but these Idiots! These idiots are worse than useless! Slim, just go out and do it yourself, please. Once you've dealt with Steve Buscemi, who voices Wesley, the cows get into Echo Mine. And. I'm sorry, did she just sass Buck? Did she just sass Buck? Buck then tries to be the hero. Again, by getting the other horse out of the equation. <sighs> that horse would have been more competent. That horse was more competent than you ever will be, Buck. Oh, God. Slim tries to yodel. He tries to yodel again. He tries to ride yodel. I'm sorry. He tries to yodel ride of the Valkyries? One of the greatest pieces of classical music of all time that was used in Apocalypse Now? 
and was also used at one point as Daniel Bryan's entrance music in the WWE. Buck ruins the glory after the cow's catch, Slim. I gave up clown college for this? Yeah, Wesley, yeah, Wesley probably should have stayed there. Oh, good. No. Mercifully, I have another 15 minutes before the credits. Slim! I got Slim! Regal's gonna be so proud of me! Oh, good grief, Buck! Just shut up! The sparks from the minecarts light up some, you guessed it, conveniently placed dynamite. By the way, can I use some of that to make this film go boom? Did somebody say boom? <laughs> yeah, like that, Sandy! So I never have to watch this film again. Oh my word. You'd think with that much dynamite, you'd expect a much bigger earth-shattering kaboom. But nevertheless, as comic book guy would, as comic book guy would put it, worst explosion ever. Oh boy! And of course, I have, of course, a train has to get involved, causing everything to fall apart. I guess I gotta do everything around here myself. Slim. Doing this all by yourself? You should have been doing that from the very beginning! And then it transpires that Rico has been working with Slim the whole time! What a twist! No, Robot Chicken! That does not warrant a what a twist! Traitor! Look, mm, not now, Kylo! This twist is just horseshoed in for the sake of making us go... Okay, now you can do your thing, Robot Chicken. What a twist! This is the equivalent of Disney making twist, twist villains for the sake of making twist villains. If not, worse. Wait, what if this is some kind of trick? Given how much garbage I've had to sit through so far, I wouldn't be surprised, Grace. So Maggie takes the hat to enrage Mrs. Calloway to break open the door. Something useful for a change at the same time. Something something useful for a change. At the same time, though, something happening that's frustrating earlier on turns out to be useful later. When did I become Cinema Sins? <laughs> Hold on. Buck does something useful for once and gets the cattle out of the train and. Hold shower! Oh, no. Wait. Did Maggie. Just seriously say that? Did Maggie just seriously say that? For that alone, your character scores go down. And just to add some more conveniently placed inconvenience, the Morning Express is heading for a collision course. What's so What's something ridiculous? Ridiculously over the top that even the laws of animation shouldn't even allow, let alone the laws of science. Or they can just switch the tracks. Still doesn't excuse the convenience of more inconvenience! The lever breaks off and collision is imminent! No! I'm done! The film has jumped the shark! The film has jumped the shark! I'm done! I'm done! I'm done! The film has jumped the shark! This film is over! I'm not doing this episode anymore! I'm finishing now! Good night, everybody! <laughs> Seriously, when did Lucky get that peg leg? Who cares because Patch of Heaven's been sold, the cows arrive by jumping the track, preventing Slim from signing the deed to the farm. The, f <laughs> the farm animals cause havoc. You wanna get nuts? Let's get nuts! Oh! Ah! The chickens referenced Batman! And Grace just makes sure it. And Grace just matrixed the bell into his mouth, and he's off to jail. Maggie stays on the farm, and they get a lot of first place rosettes from the state fair. Two bulls and a buffalo decide to stay as well, and finally, the film is over. Oh, that was not a pleasant experience, to say the least. I'm not even. Oh, boy. 
So the story gets the story is a one, as is the characters. It's terribly written. The characters are not funny. It's there's so much convenience. It's it's cookie cutter. Even the villain isn't even that intimidating. The henchmen are so dumb. Rico, why Rico and Buck? Oh my lord, Buck is so insufferable as the comic relief. Ooh! I can't believe I put myself through all of this. I cannot believe I put myself through all of this. So, at the end of the day, the visuals are two. Like I said, this is the sort of animation I would expect from a director video sequel, not an animated classic. Mind you, Chicken Little is not going to be much better. Oh, God, I am not looking forward to that. And the legacy gets a zero. I'm not even going to go into. I'm not even going to go into de into great detail. I've already given. I've already given my brief reasons. But nevertheless, we're going to go through the legacy anyway. Uh, I'm just going to get this out of the way. Critical reception: fifty-two percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Box office: oh boy. Uh. Box office, 14 million on its opening weekend, opening fourth behind Scooby-Doo 2, Walking Tall, and Hellboy. Three far superior films, especially Walking Tall, which I believe has The Rock in it. And yes, it does. Yeah. Oh, and Johnny Knoxville. The same Johnny Knoxville from Jackass? Huh, that's about that. Uh... Following the disappointing box office weekend, the financial analysts predicted that Disney would be forced to write down the production costs, which totaled more than one hundred, which totaled more than one hundred million dollars. Following the latter release of the Alamo, which also met poor box office returns, it was reported that Disney would have to write down about seventy million dollars. The film ended its box office run with $50 million domestically and $76.5 million worldwide. So less people went to see this worldwide than they did in North America. Hmm. Shows you how garbage the film was. Uh, three Annie nominations and a Best Family Feature Film nomination for a Young Artist Award. Uh, and it got released on VHS and DVD in 2004. The DVD came with an animated short, A Dairy Tale, featuring the film's voice, voice cast, and animated intros to the DVD menu featuring the same... Huh? Animated intros to the DVD menu featuring the same cast. Oh my word. The film was released on Blu-ray in July 3rd, 2012. Right, I get it. Every film has to come out on Blu-ray or 4K at this point, but this is one of those films that did not warrant. It did not deserve a Blu-ray release, but business. Well, like I say, ugh, this film is just... Ugh. I am never watching this again. I am never watching this again. This film has a total score of... 14%. This film is worse than the package era films. This film is the worst film I have ever reviewed in the Kingdom of Isolation so far. And I am not looking forward to having to go through. I am gonna have to watch the, I will have to watch through the film again so I get the right clips as well. Ugh. Nevertheless. I do have copies of I do have copies of the film, which I am going to be getting rid of, 
And if I were doing quite retrospectives on them, which I have no intention of doing anytime soon or ever, it's going to be a throw out into the garbage, which is going to be thrown out into the depths of the seven circles of hell! <laughs> Dude, calm down. Would I recommend this film to anyone? Absolutely, categorically, without a shadow of doubt, beyond rhyme or reason, no, I would not. Still, time to go through the second half of my one to suck a punch of misery with Chicken Little next time. And I am not looking forward to that at all. Jamie, I hope you're ready for this one because, oh, Boy, this is going to be one for the ages, for all the wrong reasons. That being said, hope you enjoyed this episode of The King of Isolation. If you did, hit the thumbs up, please. And if you want to be part of The King of Isolation yourself, you can hit the subscribe button down at the bottom, click the bell to join the Dream Team, to join the notification, to turn on the... <sighs> turn on the bell. Uh, click the bell, turn on notifications so you don't miss when an episode goes live. The next episode is going to be Chicken Little, and I am dreading this one. The Day of Reckoning has finally come. And until then, folks, I'll see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.